murmurs and grumbles. Murmurers and grumblers. That is what this passage is full of today. There is a theme that Jesus has produced through this passage ever since feeding the 5,000. And to recap the theme of how people are in the process of salvation, God gives people to Jesus. Jesus saves them through the cross. Jesus will not lose any that he has given. And the saved will see Jesus when he returns, either through rapture or resurrection. And he says this, or pieces of it, five times after he fed the 5,000. And it is this clarity that Jesus is the only way for salvation. It is not a different plan. It is not a different God in the Old Testament than it is in the New Testament. It is just how God decided to work, and He wants people to know that. Now, last week, Jesus claimed that He was the bread that came from heaven, and they talked about manna, things of this nature. Jesus claimed He was from heaven, and this week their response was, from, from, from. Now, why don't they just pick up stones and throw them at Him? I mean, they've done that in other passages. One reason is what it tells us in 59, verse 59. Uh, John isn't exactly bearing the lead, but he saves a very important piece of information at the very end of the passage. And that is Jesus Christ is in a synagogue. A synagogue was the holy meeting place of the Jewish people. They met on Saturday, so we know that this is Saturday. That this is the Sabbath. We also know that there are certain rules about the Sabbath. So that the people who are following him across the lake can't go home today because you can only walk 300 feet, 300 yards, three football fields, 900 feet on a Sabbath day. And they're about, if you go across the top of the lake, 25 miles away from home by this point. They follow Jesus all the way to the You know, it also notes a bit more of a formal setting. Synagogues were set up in a semicircle with seats very similar to this, and people would follow a particular order. The master of the synagogue would allow people to speak, and Jesus was allowed to speak. And so he got up in front and he said these things, and because it is a more of a sacred place, they're not going to yell at him. They're just going to grumble and murmur. And when you grumble and murmur, it means that you feel slighted. Feel that somehow a bait and switch has happened, your expectations are not met, uh, things of this nature, you feel disrespected, and so it's, you could be overly aggressive, or you could just mumble, mumble, grumble, grumble to yourself, and Jesus is getting into the position where they believe uh, it's a bait and switch. They thought this was going to be a time of free food. And great, uh, you know, a great king who's going to give them all the food they want. But now he's talking about uh, he came from heaven and the bread of heaven and things like that. And Jesus, knowing what's going on, he says, "Stop your grumbling. Listen and learn, because when you're grumbling, your learn center is shut off. You already made up your mind." Jesus wants to give them more information, so he tells them to stop grumbling. One of the difficulties that is going on here is that Jesus is presenting himself as true, as the Son of God, as true bread, as the gift from God to people, as the way people get saved, and it doesn't meet their expectations. There's an old story of a woman who made artificial fruit so perfectly that people could not tell them from the real thing. So one day she went to a contest, a competition of fake fruit makers. And when the critics came to her bowl, they looked and they ooh and ah and ooh and ah. And one of them said, ah, oh, that apple right there, that apple right there, I can tell. It's fake. All the rest of them look great, but that one is just no good. You may lose because of that. And then she picked up that apple and ate it. That was the real one. 
and all the rest will fade. And sometimes in our lives we have difficulties determining what is the real one and what is the fake one. What is true and what is false. Uh, I'm reminded of the various and numerous uh, scams that come via email and letter. And this church gets many of them. Uh, Nigerian widows who have uh, passed away or their husband have passed away. And they just want to give this church $13 million. And I say, hey, bring it on over. But of course, it's a long process where I give them a lot more money than they give me. But billions of dollars are earned, as it were, by these people in Nigeria because people have a difficulty knowing the truth from the falsehood. What Jesus is saying is that he is superior to anything they knew before. They want to go back to the wilderness and say, we had this manna, and Moses gave us this manna. And Jesus is saying that he is better than that, that he is superior to that. The whole book of Hebrews is about Christ being superior to anything they knew before. And this is the first mentioning of that sort of attitude. Jesus Christ, they have these expectations. Jesus Christ is saying he's better than that. And they're grumbling and they're murmuring, and they're not getting it. Then he says that the life of the world is in the flesh of Jesus. Ray Stenman tells the story of a woman who was raised in a non-religious family and had never gone to church. When she was in high school, Billy Graham held his first crusade, by the way, two days ago, Billy Graham turned 96. So if you didn't know that, you didn't send him a card. Billy Graham held his first crusade in Sacramento. She was invited by some of her friends to go hear him. She listened to the choir, to the testimonies, and the special music. And she said to herself, I know this man is using his words to manipulate these people. That he is psychologically preparing them to respond to an invitation, and there is nothing behind that invitation. She felt very confident that she could withstand what she considered to be manipulation, because she knew exactly what he was doing. But when Billy Graham gave the invitation, and she said, then she said, I was the first one to respond. I jumped out of my seat and went down immediately. I was embarrassed because as I walked down, I saw I was the very first person to respond. What is it that gets people to do that? What is it that gets people to respond to the invitation? Jesus says over and over again that it's God who draws, that it's God who calls. But it was God that pulled her out of her seat and pushed her down the aisle. And when God is calling, there is nothing that you can do to stop it. And what Jesus is trying to tell these opposers is that if they want eternal life, because the Jewish mind, even the Jewish mind today, has a sense of the eternal life, the most common view is that God has transported the Garden of Eden up into the clouds, and that when you die, you will get to live in a little house on the edge of the Garden of Eden if you're a good Jewish person. And so they had a sense of the, of the afterlife. The Sadducees, of course, said there's no such thing. But when Jesus Christ is talking about salvation, he begins to say that you have to eat his blood and you have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And the first thought, and this has been documented, it was cannibalism. There is actually Roman texts of people who, Romans, who went to synagogues and heard this teaching and came back and said, all these Christians are cannibals. They want to eat their Savior. And the Jews were kind of confused in this passage. They said, how in the world can we eat your flesh? How in the world can we drink your blood? At the least, it's not kosher to eat people. 
And so they were confused by that. They were confused by what he was saying. Now, we have to be careful not to say, ah, I'm just talking about communion. That's when we bring out the bread and bring out the grape juice. We say, here's his blood, here's his flesh. But it's much more than communion. It's much more than the communion idea. We have to look back at what ancient Greeks thought of this idea. Because before Jesus Christ, Alexander the Great, marched his armies across the world. He taught everybody to think Greek. And they did. That's why the New Testament was written in Greek. And that's why there's a lot of Greek thought in John. And what Greek thought says is that you are two pieces. You are your flesh and you are your blood. And you're doing things, the things you do, you work in the yard, you go to work, you drive around, you walk, all that is a work of your flesh. Your flesh in many ways has a mind of its own, they would say, to do the hard work that is necessary to live in this life. Blood, on the other hand, they felt was some sort of magical substance that actually contained your intelligence and your motivation. And if we apply this to what Jesus is saying, Jesus is saying you need to have His flesh in your flesh. In other words, you need to do the things that Jesus is doing. You need to have His blood in your blood, meaning you have the same motivation and thought patterns that Jesus have. Eventually, Jesus will get to the point, and Paul talks about it a lot in Romans, where his goal in our life is to make us little copies of himself. And if we can do the things that Jesus does, if we can think the way that Jesus thinks about things, then we can move further along the path of what the Bible also calls sanctification of where we are experiencing the holiness of God because we are acting and thinking and being like little copies of Christ. You may not know the name Paul Brand, but he was a famous missionary doctor. And one day when he was in London at a hospital, orderly squealed in a beautiful young woman into his ward, and she had lost much blood in an accident. It had drained from her skin, leaving her an unearthly pale color, and her oxygen-starved brain had shut down into an unconscious mode. A nurse dashed down the corridor for a blood transfusion bottle, while a doctor fumbled with the apparatus to get the transfusion going. They could not detect even the faintest pulse in her cold, limp wrist. She looked like a wax museum exhibit or a marble statue in a cathedral. She did not seem to be breathing, and Paul was certain she was dead. The nurse arrived with a bottle of blood. The doctor punctured the woman's vein with a large needle. They set the bottle high and gained more pressure so that the blood would empty into her body faster. The staff told Paul to keep watch as they hurried off for more blood. As the nervous as the nervous nurse held her wrist, suddenly he could feel the faintest press of a pulse. The next bottle arrived and was quickly connected. A spot of pink appeared on her cheeks and spread into a beautiful flush. Her lips darkened pink and red, and her eyelids fluttered lightly, and at last parted. She squinted at first and then looked directly at Paul and asked for some water. That is, in many ways, the story of the Christian life. Is the more that we sit there and let Jesus Christ pour Himself into us and move into us, the more that we can be what He wants us to be. Jesus must be known and lived. You start with the Scripture. You start with Teaching, you start with knowing who Jesus Christ is, and then you step out and say, 
well, I'm going to try this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do a little faith stretching and do something that's a little uncomfortable. Andrew Kelly came across a health food restaurant in Cambridge, Massachusetts with a billboard proclaiming, eat here and live a long life. The barbecue pit right next door posted this response, eat here and die happy. <laughs> the great thing about the Christian life is we can do them both. Is we can live a long life and we can be happy because we will have the life of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ in everything we do. The people grumbled because they wanted to do things their way. The people grumbled because they wanted to do things their own thinking. They wanted to come up with the answers and what Jesus Christ is saying is that for thousands of years their way was failing and it was now time to follow God. It was now time to follow Jesus Christ. And so today, your challenge is to, is to see in your life where the flesh of Christ and the blood of Christ is missing. You need to be hungry for Jesus. You need to feed on Jesus. You need to get into His Word. You need to get into the church community. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I just praise You for... For sending your Son to die on the cross, that through believing in Him, we can have eternal life. And through eternal life, we can grow, we can know you, and we can be little copies of Jesus Christ on earth. Lord, we praise you for that. We ask that you would show us places where we are lacking, show us places where we need to give you more sweat. Lord, we praise you for that. And ask your blessing upon the lunch to follow. We ask this in the blood of Jesus Christ.